So we will begin uh, this presentation, which is going to be very, very interesting, called Can Evolution Survive the New Biological Insights? Well, we want to begin with a word of prayer and just ask that God would be here with us. Dear God, thank you so much that we're able to once again come together to study uh, science and to see how science validates your word. We just want to pray for, especially for Dr. Brand, that you would be at his side and that you would give him the clarity of mind and also help us after we've eaten to have the clarity of mind to hear what he has to say. Thank you for your many blessings. Thank you that you're here with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. With that said, I would just like to invite Dr. Brand up here again. He's a professor at Loma Linda, and uh, he has done so many, so much research, phenomenal research on uh, geological phenomena that support creation. And you've been sharing a good deal of that with us. Now you're going to go over to a new topic that really examines the biological aspect of things. So we look forward to hearing this as well. Biological evolution. And uh, what's the evidence like? I can remember a couple of decades ago, we wondered about a lot of things, you know, how do we explain this or that evidence. It's kind of a whole new day now. And so I'll bring you up to date as to what. So we're going to evaluate the current state of the evidence for the evolution of life forms by random mutation and natural selection. And to understand this topic, we need to give a little bit of just a, a one sh screen here of, of history. Darwin developed his theory in the mid-1800s. Molecular biology was, was unknown. They, they thought that a cell was a little bag with a few things in it, a few things floating around that could easily evolve. Thing about molecular biology at that time. Genetics was still decades in the future, and of course, to understand evolution, you'd have to understand genetics, and yet nothing was known. Then go fast forward to the, the 1930s and 1940s. Now there was a, several prominent people started putting together uh, what's known in population biology, genetics, mathematical biology, and paleontology, all these fields trying to fit this together, and they developed what's call, uh, called the, the modern synthesis or the neo-Darwinian synthesis, with a lot of information that Dar well, was unknown completely in Darwin's day. Um, this is pretty much evolutionary biology as it is understood today. Now, molecular biology was still in the... Uh, genetics was, was, a, was going okay. Molecular biology is still in the future. So then you come up to um, now, the, since the 1950s, molecular biology is a field that has become, um, uh, was on its way, and has rapidly advanced recently. So a lot of information that was totally unknown in Darwin's day. And if we can ask more specifically, what do we know now that we didn't know a few decades ago? Well, um, there have been recent developments, very rapid developments in the last five to ten years. Rapid advance in genetics and molecular biology. And so this puts us in a new situation now to understand life. Well, there are some definitions just to begin with for those who are, who are not um, biologists. Microevolution and macroevolution. Microevolution is adaptation uh, of animals to new environments, changes within a species. And this lizard is a good example. This is the, these are the same species of lizard. Uh, this one lives on the gray granite, granite uh, rocks in California. This one is the same species living on the red sandstone in Arizona. Okay, so they are the same species. They can interbreed with each other. They, but they, they have adapted to different environments. Okay, to, to make this change, you don't have to evolve any new organ systems or any new, probably any, anything new, really. You just, um, variation within the same uh, genetic system. <clears throat> Macroevolution, 
is, is a different category. Macroevolution is a word that is defined differently by different evolutionary biologists. It's not used consistently. So the way I'm using it is to refer to evolution of new major groups, orders, classes, and phyla, for instance. Okay, this, in this system, you don't have to evolve any new systems, any, anything new. You don't have to invent any new things. Here, to, to go from bacteria to invertebrates to, to fish to reptiles to mammals, you have, evolution would have to invent new organ systems, uh, lungs, bones, feathers, um, brains, all, I mean, all these would have to be invented by the evolutionary process. And so this is, is a very different category uh, of, uh, from this one. And microevolution, this, the same changes that make new, uh, the within a species also can make new species and new genera. So, but you don't have to evolve anything new for that to happen. And microevolution is definitely compatible with creation. Adaptation since creation. There's nothing re really radically uh, different about that from, from creation. Macroevolution is clearly contrary to biblical creation. So that's the difference between those two. Now, how does microevolution work? <clears throat> and this is, an, this is an important point. The accepted evolutionary theory, and this would be true actually for microevolution and macroevolution. Uh, evolution, the evolution theory um, would say that all change has to come about by this process, random mutations and natural selection. So random, random mutation, random change to the DNA. Um, and then, so random mutation, it has to be random in relationship to the needs of the animal. If you don't have a creator, you don't have any intelligence evolved, there, nothing, there could be nothing there that would know what would be good for the animal. That's why it has to be random. If they're not random, something's going on. Somebody knows what's needed. Okay, and that can't be in a Darwinian theory. It has to start out with random, and only natural selection can determine uh, which is going to survive. And, of course, natural selection is a very simple thing. Uh, faster rabbits will outrun more coyotes. Okay, there's nothing radical or, or complicated about natural selection. But that could be the only process that determines which of these mutations will survive. Okay, these two concepts are the core of neo-Darwinism, the core of evolution theory. There can be no foresight here that would be beneficial to know what would be beneficial to the organism. That has to start with random changes. And this is a little, a little analogy that can illustrate what we're talking about. This is from a, like an automobile factory. You've got a machine that makes pistons. And it has a little computer up here on the top that, that controls the process. And then you have something, maybe a lightning hits it or something hits it, makes a random change in the instructions. And it makes wider pistons. Okay, that illustrates how evolution would work. Uh, and of course, it would take more than one chain, one mutation to, to do anything significant. But still, it has to start out with these random changes. It cannot be any foresight to know what would be needed. And that's the, th that's the theory in, in a simple form describing how the evolution theory works. And now I'm going to go through some problems for Darwinian theory of, natural, of random mutation and natural selection. And these problems are rapidly increasing. And so I'm not talking here today about arguments between creationists and evolutionists. I'm talking about problems that are developing within science, within uh, people who don't necessarily even believe in creation. But science is advancing very rapidly. We're finding things that are causing problems for Charlie Darwin. Okay, problem number one, junk DNA. Now, about 98, well, part of our DNA is instructions for making proteins, little recipes for making different proteins. Okay, and so for decades that has been understood as being what's important. That's the only thing that, that really uh, is important, these, protein, these genes that make proteins. About 98% of our DNA is is silent DNA. It does not make protein. 
does not do anything. Okay, so would you be willing to have 98% of your DNA removed? <laughs> okay, um, and that, that silent DNA that doesn't make protein has been interpreted as junk DNA, functionless remnants of evolution. In the evolution process, there were genes that were needed, needed at some point. Now they're just junk, not doing anything. And in fact, evolution needs that junk DNA. Because how are they going to invent new genes? Well, you have to have something to start with. You start with an old gene that isn't doing anything. You mutate it randomly, mutate it until it makes some other protein. So evolution needs that junk DNA. Well, there have been problems along the way. This is somebody made this this graph uh, from a very extensive literature review on on junk DNA. And they find that um, the percentage, this is the percent of DNA that does not make protein. In other words, junk DNA. Okay, prokaryotes, that's the very simplest organisms. Uh, it's mostly, uh, you have very little junk DNA. Most of it is, is good protein making DNA. Then you get or more and more complicated organisms, um, plants, fungi, invertebrates, chordates, vertebrates, and finally humans. <coughs> And so the more complicated the organism, the higher percent of DNA is junk. Does that make sense? Uh, why would humans have the highest percentage of DNA that's junk? Um, it looks suspiciously like the junk DNA is somehow involved in making that complexity. Why else would we have more junk DNA than this, the simple uh, one-celled things? So that, was, that seemed to point to, to some problems. And as the years went by, <clears throat> once in a while we'd see articles that, that was raising doubts about junk DNA. And this is one of my favorites. It's the junk that makes us human. Could it be the non-coding DNA, that is the DNA that's not making protein, could it be that protein that makes us human? And they're finding evidence that some of this junk is actually is regulating the other DNA. And so um, the, these, in, these uh, periodicals that would come out period, uh, you know, once in a while finally reached a, a, um, a head at, at the time of this publication. There was a massive project called the ENCODE project. It was a detailed study of human DNA by several hundred of the best molecular biologists around the world, uh, a vast government-supported research project. And finally, in September 2012, they published uh, their results, 30 different articles, all published at once, and the, the, the core of those published in, in the prestigious journal Nature. And they found out that, junk, that uh, the supposed junk DNA controls what our protein coding DNA is doing. Con controls uh, whether or not that um, pr protein coding DNA will make a human, a chimpanzee, or a mouse. Okay, you can take, um, you can take uh, the same bricks, you can build a doghouse or a palace. It depends on your engineering drawings and what you do with those bricks. And the protein are like bricks. You know, you can make a, a, a chimpanzee or a human or a mouse and it's, it turns out that it's this supposed junk DNA that tells it what to do. It's controlling all the other DNA. And so junk DNA is really no longer even a useful concept. Um, I, I remember in the 70s, some of my molecular biologist friends were predicting that junk DNA would turn out to be important. And that is what has happened. Junk DNA is not junk at all. That term is not even a useful concept anymore. Um, it is the important part of the DNA, DNA that telling what to do. Uh, DNA is like a, like a hard drive in your computer. You take your hard disk out, set it by itself, what will it do? Absolutely nothing. It, it's a huge amount of information, but a hard drive will do nothing without the management system that tells what to do with, as in, with that information. Well, DNA is the same. And it, it turns out that, that, that the uh, the supposed junk DNA, that's what's important, telling what's going to happen. And that's been a, break, a great breakthrough that has raised serious problems for, 
for Darwinism. Problem number two. This is the, the called the tree of life. The idea that life has evolved from very simple organisms to all these more complex types of creatures. And that's called the tree of life. It's, a, um, it's the history, the history book of, of our evolution. And, um, and the, 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 the idea is all the genes that you would find in this complex creature can be traced back, how they evolved. You can trace back how those genes evolved from simpler organisms. Okay, that's the tree of life. And that's facing some serious setbacks at this point. And much of this is because of new findings in, in molecular biology. Understanding what's happening inside the cell. I, I remember, what, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, I was giving a talk to a group of academy teachers. And one of them asked me a question. It says, why is there new evidence supporting evolution, that's giving evolutionary biologists more confidence than they've had before? And that's an interesting question, and I, can, I will we'll answer that as we go along. And I can answer it better now than I could at that time because of recent discoveries. Now geneticists can uh, sequence entire genomes of organisms. Couldn't do that a few years back. Okay, and one of the biggest problems that's coming up now is the discovery of orphan genes. Being able to sequence DNA is giving insights that just were not available five to 10 years ago. And orphan genes are genes that seem to just appear with no evolutionary ancestry. Okay, think of this tree here. If, if a, a certain gene is found in a squirrel, if Darwin was right, you'd have to be able to trace that gene back how it changed little by little by little as you finally came up to a squirrel. A gene cannot just pop into place. That, that can't happen by random change. Okay, but now it's known that that's exactly what happens. Uh, honeybees have genes that tell it how to make honey. That's pretty cool. I, I'm, I, uh, I love honey. But how did they learn how to do that? Well, they have these genes that they have that you cannot find the ancestors to those genes. There is no evolution that that evolved, the ability to make honey evolved. It just, bam, all of a sudden it was there in honeybees. Now that's an orphan gene. And that's not a rare, a rare example. Um, there, there are at least 10 to 20% of genes, of all genes, that are actually orphan genes. Uh, humans have hundreds of them. Um, and some of them are very important in, in the structure of our human brain. Okay, so orphan genes, they, they did, there's no evidence that they evolved. They just appear, bam, all of a sudden, there they are. And that, um, I can explain that by creation. Pretty tough to explain it by, by um, evolution, by Darwinian theory. So that is a serious problem uh, for evolutionists. And I, it's been interesting to read some articles and see how they're coping with it. And there's one paper that talked about, well, you know, what, what are these things? We don't know. It looks like they just come about de novo. Now, what does that mean? Well, it sounds like creation. But, of course, they will not accept that. But they're recognizing that these are, these are a strange problem. They just all of a sudden appear. If God created all these creatures, well, that's not a problem. He made each creature with the kind of genes they needed. And you didn't, there were no evolutionary ancestors to those genes. So that is a serious setback. For evolution. Problem number three is epigenetics. The word epigenetics means above the DNA or beyond, beyond the genetics. Um, this is a management system that determines how to use the DNA. Remember that, that hard drive? It will do nothing by itself. You have to have a management system that tells how to use the information. Well, now we're beginning to know what that is. Sensors in the cell detect factors in the environment and they, they, it places little chemical tags on the DNA. I don't think you can see them from back with there, but here's the little pink tag, one there, one there. Um, okay, these little pink tags are representative of little tiny chemicals that are put on the DNA in different places, and they control the genes. They turn genes on or off, or, or control how they're, how they're used. And this is something that is, it's, 
It's been studied since at least the 1980s, but it only recently is really being understood what this is, what it's doing. They don't change the information in the DNA. These are not mutations. The DNA is the same, but this tells uh, how to use that DNA. Um, I often wondered what this, what this means, punishing the children for the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. That, that was a big puzzle. Well, now we know what that is. Here's, an, here's a, from an article published in the prestigious journal Nature with this, with this picture, and the title is The Sins of the Father. Where did they get that? <laughs> it's from this text. And epigenetics is discovering um, how things change because of the environment, and then those changes can be inherited for several generations. Um, how, when, when we bring a child into the world, the factors that are affecting the parents can influence what happens with the child. Stress or what they eat, that will make these little changes in the DNA with the little tags that turn genes on and off, and they affect uh, the child. And these are not mutations. There are things that happen because of the environment, and they can be, they can be inherited for more than one generation. Um, this article described a research project that, that illustrates this. <clears throat> they, they took white mice, male white mice, and they would expose them to, the, to a very gentle odor, the odor of peach blossoms. Um, and several times a day, they'd expose them to that odor and give them a little mild sh electric shock on their foot. And they did this for only about three days. And after that, the males would really respond negatively to that odor. Okay, then, then they would mate those two females that had never exper experienced this odor. And the babies, when they were exposed to that gentle odor, they would have the same reactions as their fathers. That same negative reactions, and there were even anatomical changes in the in the olfactory part of the brain. So they had not never experienced those shocks, and yet they inherited those changes by these epigenetic processes. These are not mutations. the The father's experience put these little tags on the DNA, and the the babies inherited it, and that was inherited for several generations. Okay, so these are not mutations. This is not evolution. This is epigenetic management of the genetic system. And it, it's, uh, it's becoming more and more understood. It's a very important factor in um, our inheritance system. Um, and these can last for several generations. And I'll give another example of that. Blind cave fish. How did they become blind? Well, for years I've taught my students the standard explanation. And that is fish were in a cave, there's no light, and so random mutations destroyed their sight. And since there's no light, they can't see anyway in the cave, it didn't matter. And so natural selection would not eliminate those. And so that's how they became blind. Well, um, I also tell my students sometimes that uh, half of what we teach them is wrong. The problem is we don't know which half until science moves on and makes discoveries. Well, we know now that this is wrong. What I was teaching them was wrong. Uh, the new understanding is that epigenetics is what causes this blind cave fish. There are no mutations. The eye genes are still intact. They're perfectly good. But there's no light, and so epigenetics has turned off those genes. They don't need their eyes. Turn them off. It just costs a lot of energy to make eyes. Okay, that's the new explanation. And there are just a lot of, more and more of these things are being discovered uh, uh, that are a matter of epigenetics. Actually, for, for decades, we were all very naive um, to think that the DNA by itself is enough. Because it's like, think about that hard drive. I mean, we never, biologists never thought about this. You, just the information, the DNA is not enough. You have to have a management system to decide what to do with that information. And that's what epigenetics is. Okay, so why am I saying this is a problem for Darwinism? The, problem, the reason it's a problem is because in epigenetics, the environment influences uh, and initiates changes that have three characteristics. They're beneficial, 
They're inheritable and they're non-random. Remember the, the core of Darwinian theory. Any new change in evolution has to start with random mutations. If they're not random, somebody's meddling with the system. Somebody who knows what will be beneficial is influencing what happens. And these are not starting with random changes. They're, they're not random. And they're inheritable. All these things are, are, are uh, they just can't be in, in Darwinian theory. And yet there's increasing evidence for epigenetics. It, it's something very real. And so it's causing headaches for, for evolutionary biology. And they're not dealing with it very well. Okay, how can, how can this happen? Beneficial changes, how can this happen unless there is somehow intelligent awareness behind that system? Now, I don't think God is causing all these little changes all the time. But, but somebody who knows made the system. So the designer made the system to know what is needed and what will be beneficial. Uh, and that is, a, is anathema to, to um, evolution, to Darwinian theory. So this is causing, like I say, really big headaches for, for evolutionary biologists. And it's epigenetics. They're trying to sort of almost deny epigenetics. And yet it seems to be here this to stay. And it's growing. The evidence is growing stronger uh, every year. Problem number four. Irreducible complexity. Okay, here's a... a, a a, a bacterium, it has a little tail that, that spins around and it moves the bacterium. Um, one of the faculty in our department does research on these. They're fan fantastically complex little systems. And this thing doesn't just whip back and forth. It spins. There's an electric motor right here. There's an electric motor that spins this thing. It, it's actually a proton motor, but it works just like an electric motor. It, it makes this thing spin and uh, it whips this thing around and makes the bacterium move. So it's got all the complicated parts that an electric motor has. Okay, now you think, if you're, if you're trying to evolve this system, if you got half of this in place, uh, will it be useful? No, I won't do anything at all. You have to have the whole thing there uh, before it will work. That's what's meant by irreducible complexity. The complexity has to reach a certain level before it will work. And uh, if you're starting, if you're trying to do this with random mutations, how, are you, how is it going to work? How are you going to randomly make this part and then this part and then this part? It won't do anything until it's all there and all works. That's irreducible complexity. And our body is full of features, of structures that are irreducibly complex. They won't work until they're all there. And so how can you evolve that? Uh, how can you make a motor by chance and you, you have half of it there, I mean, a, a car, half of it there, the other half isn't there, it won't work until, it's, until all the important parts are there. Uh, this thing is irreducibly complex. If you take out the lungs or whatever, I mean, different parts, it won't work. And nature is full of irreducibly complex things. Okay, so that's a serious problem for evolution. And this is a whole big topic in itself. Uh, there's a book by, by B. Heat uh, called Darwin's Black Box. It will introduce you to this topic. But life is full of these irreducibly complex parts. They have to all be there before they will work. And Charles Darwin does not have an explanation for that. Problem number five. And this kind of takes these four things I've talked about and puts them together and, and with new insights from molecular biology. There are a group of, of biologists called new evolutionists, and they recognize that Darwinian random mutations and natural selection don't work. They're, these are molecular biologists, and, they, and they're understanding that the cell now is so sophisticated that random mutations just can't be a part of that system. They won't work. Um, new genetic information must arise some other way than by random changes. Now, these people I'm talking about here are not creationists. Well, certainly there are creationists who think this way. But the, the primary researchers I'm referring to are not creationists. They just recognize that Darwinism doesn't work. And here, here's one. His name is James Shapiro. He wrote a book, Evolution of View from the 21st Century. 
And he's, he's very candid, and I like the way he talks. The modern evolutionary synthesis concluded an ad hoc assumption. Okay, what's ad hoc? An ad hoc idea means one that is not based on evidence, but it's required by your theory. Okay, an ad hoc assumption about the random nature of hereditary variation. And here he says it requires great faith, great faith, keep that in mind, to believe that a process of random accidental genome change could serve the function of adaptation. I couldn't have said it better myself. Um, random, to make new things, to make us by random changes, that's pretty hard to believe. Hereditary change results from active cell processes rather than a series of random accidents. And he calls this natural genetic engineering. Cells are now reasonably seen to operate teleologically, that is, with purpose. The cells have a purpose. Their purpose is survival, growth, and reproduction. And he actually, he says that the, that the, the these factors in the cell um, decide, okay, decide how to interpret the DNA. Now that's pretty interesting that this other factors in the cell can decide how to use the DNA. They're not just slaves to DNA. So how do they explain how this process came about? Well, um, they just recognize that random mutations cannot be the source of genetic change. Uh, this, this guy Shapiro, he says that this evolution process, how that came to be, is a mystery. He recognizes that we just, there isn't evidence to show how this can happen. It's a mystery. And I couldn't have said it better myself. I think, and I think the only explanation for that mystery is, is the creator. So what they're learning about cells tells me we have to modify this simple diagram. Uh, for, for the process to work this way, these random changes, that's like, I, I want to see if I can make this computer work faster. So I take a screwdriver and I jam it in the computer. Okay, is that going to help? I don't think so. Well, that's what random mutation does. So it's really more like this. And sticking with the same uh, analog, you have this thing that makes pistons, has a master controller, and really what you've got is you've got all these sensors that the cells have and that our bodies have that evaluate the environment, all the information that's coming in uh, into our bodies and into the cells. And then they're sending information to, to control modules, the software. And there's, a, there's a stage one controllers, stage two controllers, stage three controllers. And they're all, they're all talking to each other and integrating information and then communicating with the master controller. That's more like what's really happening inside the cell. It's just mind-boggling what's going on inside the cell. <clears throat> and, and they're discovering that they're if errors do occur, and er errors do occur in, this, in the cell to the DNA, but there are uh, uh, totally amazing error correction systems. Uh, hundreds of these systems in the simplest cells that can notice errors in the DNA and correct them. And then there's something else here that I want to talk about. And I, I'm calling this standby specifications. All right, what's that mean? Well. There is information, organisms have standby genetic information which provides potential for change. And I believe this is something that has to have been created in there in the beginning. And here's my favorite example of that. Dogs. All right, there are, there are several hundred varieties of dogs that have been produced by selective breeding. And most of these in the last couple of hundred years. We know the history of these. We know how this happened. And uh, dogs apparently come from, from the wolf. Now, were there dogs on the ark? Well, I don't know. But there's some dogs are so similar to wolves, it really doesn't matter. Um, so this, this guy here has the genetic information to make this uh, pathetic little creature and, and these magnificent dogs. Okay, all of this comes from the wolf. And that's, per, that's pretty well established. I mean, and keep in mind, this cannot be by evolution because most of these breeds were produced in the last couple of hundred years. That's far too fast for, for evolution to, to have happened. All this information had to be there in the beginning before people even decided they wanted to make different kinds of dogs. 
and this is these are not mutations. There are a few mutations that have affected some kinds of dogs, but mostly this is all epigenetic variation, turning genes on and off and varying them, selecting what you want to make all these varieties of dogs. And I know no other creature that has this kind of variability, anything even close to it. Dogs are amazing. Um, so how did this happen? Well, if the information had to be there before we even started making these varieties, it, it didn't evolve. It had to be there. Who put it there? I, I believe that God made wolves with dogs in mind. Uh, he made wolves with the genetic potential to make everything from Chihuahuas to Great Danes, knowing that we would need um, protection and companionship and all the other things that dogs do so well. God made that there from the beginning. I, don't, I know of no other explanation. I have not seen anything that could give another explanation for why these. I've seen an article by an evolutionary biologist who puzzled over how it could be the dogs have this much variation. Well, I would suggest an answer to him. And you compare with other animals. The other animals are not like that. How about cats? Uh, there are a lot of cat lovers that would like to make many different varieties of cats. But you, 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 you know, I mean, the, there's the big cats, but leave them aside, the, the, the domestic cats. There are a lot of breeds, but if you shave their hair off, they all look about the same. There just are no Doberman cats or Bulldog cats. There's nothing like that. Cats just don't have much genetic variability in them. So why did God make cats? Well, I always get chuckles when I ask that question. Um, maybe he made them to keep us humble, to remind us that we're not in charge. So this is that standby genetic potential that I'm talking about, um, that, the God, that God had to have put there in the first place. And so, if random change, if random mutations do happen, and there there is random, there are random changes. That's random damage. Then, what's the most likely outcome? Well, one outcome is system failure. You die of cancer. Uh, another one, reduced efficiency. Our bodies just don't work as well as they they're supposed to. Anybody experience that? Um, or the third one, mutation is eliminated by the error correction system, and that's probably the most common. Now, of course, mutations do get through, in spite of the, the wonderful error correction systems, some mutations do get, get through. And so that's why the human race is degrading. Some geneticists say our, our DNA, our, our genome is degrading about 1% per generation. Um, the human race has problems. And you trace it, you go from the, the after the flood, you look in the Bible, the ages of a, after the flood, and then you go from generation to generation, and those ages drop like this. That's, an, that's a biological decay curve. Something is wrong. After the flood, mutations are doing their, their, their damage. And uh, one thing this tells us, if we're getting worse each generation, how could we have been here for millions of years? We would all be dead. Um, there's a good book on that topic by a man named uh, John Sanford. Okay, so that's... That's the problem being caused by these, uh, by, by new, dis new discoveries in genetics. Now let's look at um, a series of diagrams that kind of illustrate part of this. Microevolution, is it just an accumulation of micro, no, macroevolution, is it just an accumulation of microevolution over the time? This is what has been believed uh, by, by evolutionary biologists, that macroevolution is not really different you just have a lot of changes by microevolution. Those add up to a new kind of organism. Well, is it really? Does it work that way? Okay, here's microevolution, changes within a species. Macroevolution would be if you evolve a um, reptile and a mammal from a common ancestor. So that's very different. In this diagram, um, microevolution and macroevolution, this is the, they've been thought to be the same process. So they're going along together. But new, new evidence is, is showing, well, maybe that's not really quite like that, quite right. Macroevolution seems to be a different process from microevolution. Macroevolution is different. And, and the evidence, I would say, is pushing it farther and farther apart. 
new information is saying no macroevolution um, is different. And notice these green lines. In my diagram, that's the boundary line between naturalism or material atheism and creation. So if this would go up into this area, now we got, we're requiring creation to somehow be involved. And so what's really happening? Well, micro, understanding of microevolution is changing. Microevolution and the development of new species. It's realizing that now that that doesn't take thousands of years as used to be thought. It happens fast. Microevolutionary changes adapt, adapting like this can happen in the lifetime of a research grant. It's happening fast. And creationists have been predicting that for years and the evidence is supporting that. And it's moving up into what I would interpret is it's most consistent with, with a creationist understanding. Uh, things like epigenetics, that doesn't fit Darwinism. Uh, such rapid adaptation, uh, all these things are making it easier to explain even microevolution by if it starts with creation. Okay, so what's happening down here with macroevolution? Well, macroevolution is even worse, in even worse condition. We can argue about this part up here, but macroevolution is collapsing. It really is collapsing. Intelligent design is having an in, its in, input. No junk DNA, that's a serious problem. Irreducible complexity, orphan genes, epigenetics, molecular complexity, all these things are just creating chaos with macroevolution theory. Okay? The evidence, macroevolution theory is collapsing. The evidence favors creation. And this is coming about largely from new discoveries in molecular biology. So, how are the evolutionary scientists responding to these challenges? Um, no junk DNA, orphan genes, epigenetics, the failure of Darwinism. How are they responding? And here's where I can begin to answer that question that a, that a teacher asked years ago. Is there new evidence that's, that's making it, uh, that's giving them more confidence? Well, I wondered about that, so I got the current edition of all the evolution textbooks that are out there. Okay, these, these are seven evolutionary textbooks and a book of readings. Um, none, of these, none of these ever mention orphan genes. Now why, why would that be? Um, well, they can't explain it. That's probably why. Um, epigenetics, uh, some of them don't mention the term epigenetics. Some do. But they all minimize it. Try to say, well, it really isn't doing anything very important. Um, and so that's how they're dealing with it. They're, they're denying it is what it amounts to. But there are four other books, evolutionary books, um, by this group called the, the New Evolutionists. They're recognizing that epigenetics is here to stay. And so they're trying to use it as a source of a new evolutionary theory. And there's a conflict going on between these two groups, the New Evolutionists and the, the sort of the hardcore Darwinists. Um, there was a, a big conference in Europe last year between these two groups. Um, and the reports from there is that the, the new, the new uh, evolutionists would give their evidence. And these guys, the kind of the standard hardcore Darwinists, they would just say, well, natural selection will take care of that. They didn't really have answers. And it, the, the conference didn't get anywhere. And so macroevolution is facing increasingly serious challenges. And remember, these people I'm talking about are not creationists. Eminent evolutionists, primarily molecular biologists, are raising these challenges and rejecting Darwinian theories. So why do evolutionary biologists seem to be more committed to the theory than ever? And that's because of philosophy, not because of evidence. Because of this firm commitment to naturalism. If, if, you're, if you think as a naturalist, you will not accept the idea of creation. You just can't. If to do so would be to change your whole worldview, and they're not willing to do that. They don't believe, they really believe in, in evolution, and they're not willing to consider any uh, objections to it, even in spite of the evidence. So here in this diagram now, it kind of puts a lot of this together. Um, our Darwinian theory is collapsing largely because of the molecular challenges. And now here we have, this is the green line, remember, if your explanation goes 
Outside of that, now you're acquiring creation. Well, here are several names. Shapiro, Denton, Mueller, Pigliucci. Um, these are, are not creationists. But they recognize that Darwinism doesn't work. So I still have their names here below this green line. They're not creationists. But here we have what I'm calling hardline Darwinists. And some prominent names, uh, Dawkins, Jerry Coyne, Pennock, etc. Uh, these people, they're unwilling to recognize what these guys are saying, that Darwinism doesn't work. No matter what the evidence, they're hanging on to their, to their Darwinian theory for philosophical reasons, in spite of what the evidence says. Okay, so there's this conflict going on between these guys and these guys. And so that's what's happening out there in, in science. It's not just the creationists against the evolutionists anymore. But you have this, this, this argument between these different groups um, who are not ready to become creationists, but this group generally says Darwinism doesn't work. These guys hang on to it um, tooth and nail. They're, they're not willing to change. Okay, conclusions. Darwinian theory of, nat of evolution through random mutations is facing deadly challenges. And I'm, I'm saying it's collapsing. You could just say it's dead. Uh, quite frankly, it's dead. Um, there's a going, growing conflict within science between the hardline Darwinists and the new evolutionists who recognize the collapse of Darwinism. So for creationists, we have increasing reasons to be confident of our literal creation. This is a new day for us. These are not minor problems. These are not minor arguments. This is a new day for us. Uh, we don't have to be... You remember I, I said a couple decades ago we used to wonder, uh, how are we going to explain the biological evidence for evolution? Well, forget it. That's over. They're the ones who are, 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 are struggling right now. And they hang on to the theory for philosophical reasons. So, how can we grasp the full truth about origins? You know, there's a lot of things, specific little arguments we, we make that are interesting and helpful. But really, to, to understand what's going on, we really have, a, have to have an understanding of life, all the complexities of life processes. What's really going on in a cell? And how could that come about by itself? The deeper our broad-scale knowledge of the processes of life becomes, the more likely it is that ideas like abiogenesis, that's the evolution of life from non-living, and large-scale macroevolution will sink into an abyss of impossibility right next to a plan to build a railroad to Mars. Is that going to work? No, that'll, this, this has as much likelihood of, as, of working as macroevolution or the origin of life. Those ideas are really dead as long as we're willing to open our minds and consider that, that God may, may know what's going on. But some other conclusions. God loves all persons. Um, I see too much ridicule going between the two groups, creationists and evolutionists. That's very unfortunate. Be respectful of those you disagree with, even though we reject their beliefs about origins. Um, our standard, our confidence is still the Bible. Our, our, our faith cannot be based on science, because there are evidences that, that go both directions. Um, but our standard is the Bible. Uh, God is using science to encourage us, so we can be, be glad for that. And the, the more we confidence we have in the Bible, the more solid our science can be. Thank you. I want to take some questions. Uh, I will go around with a microphone if you have any questions. Questions from previous presentations, questions from this presentation, questions that you had 10 years ago. Uh, any questions that you have, feel free to, to ask those questions. So in regards to the theory of evolution, was Darwin the first one to put that forward? And are there significant evolutionists today that are outside of Darwinism? Well, D Darwin was not the first one. Uh, but he was in an era when um, scholars were moving more and more away from any kind of authority, including the Bible. And deliberately, philosophers were deliberately pushing in that direction. And so Darwin was in an era when it was becoming more acceptable. And there are others who came up with theories, parts of his theory. He kind of put it together into a way that was more convincing. It didn't have a better mechanism. His, 
His idea of natural selection did not become the predominant thinking among biologists until the 1930s and 40s. But Darwin, what he did is he put together evidence in a way that convinced those who wanted to think that way that there might be a way to get, get rid of the creator. <laughs> okay, and what was your other part? Other, other, okay, today, they're the hardcore Darwinists. There are those I mentioned who are not ready to become creationists, but, they're, but they, they recognize that Darwinism doesn't work and there has to be some new explanation. And I, I do believe there's another group. Uh, there's a friend of mine who's an evolutionary biologist at the University of California. And, uh, he, but he's, a, he's not an atheist. He definitely is a believer. And I don't know exactly what he thinks about evolution, but I think he's really not too different from us. But he told a story. There's a book um, that's well known among evolutionary biologists. It's called uh, Darwin's Finches by a man named David Lack. And this guy said that uh, David Lack's book on Darwin's Finches is, is well known. Most people don't know he also wrote a book on theology. And he said David Lack didn't know what to do with the evidence for evolution, but he was not willing to give up on God. And he made the comment, he says, I think there are a lot of David Lacks out there, and I, I believe that too. You, you just, if you're at a university, you don't dare express doubts, or you get fired. I mean, like, there are many cases of that. And so, I believe there are a lot of people who just don't know what to do, what to say. <laughs> Someday, we'll find out who they are. Um, I had the question, can genes that have been turned on be turned off later? Like, say, in your genetic makeup? And then, uh, you know, in, on the same line, like, the genes that were turned off, like in the fish, mm -hmm. can they be turned back on if mm -hmm. they're exposed to the light, but kind of more related to humans. Sure. Well, in terms of humans, yeah, these things are not necessarily permanent. If you've got s stresses that have caused these changes, if things, say a generation or two later, if they kind of get straightened out, yeah, you can go back to a more normal situation. Um, in terms of the, of the bigger changes like the blind cave fish, I don't think we know yet. Uh, there's probably a lot more research needed to really know for sure how far this can go. So we'll take a five-minute break.